All right, um, let's continue on with our chapter 12, in which we're looking at the functional groups of alcohols, thiols, ethers, aldehydes, and ketones. So we saw a lot in part one about the alcohols, the thiols, the ethers. Um, part two, we'll begin looking at the aldehydes and the ketones. So oh, aldehydes and ketones, those two functional groups have something in common, and it is the carbonyl group. They are both considered what we call in organic chemistry, carbonyl compounds. Carbonyl compounds are any compound that contain a carbonyl group. A carbonyl group, recall, is a carbon that is doubly bonded to an oxygen atom. So think about it. Think about polarities of the various atoms. Carbon in the periodic table, take a good look at it, where it is, take a good look at where oxygen is. Oxygen is more polar than carbon. So carbonyl groups are strongly polarized. They're going to have a partial positive charge on the carbon and a partial negative charge on the oxygen. And recall how we indicate that. All right, we indicate it with the delta plus on the carbon atom and the delta negative on the oxygen. So. The aldehyde and the ketone, recall, are not the only functional groups that contain a carbonyl. Carbonyl compounds not only include the aldehydes, the ketones, but they also include the carboxylic acids, the esters, and the amides. So let's take this time and just do a little bit of review of our functional groups you have to have these down pat and you have to be able to recognize them when they are standing alone all right so here is an aldehyde a ketone carboxylic acid has that carbonyl and the hydroxyl group the ester has the carbonyl and then an oxygen and an alkyl group the amide has the carbonyl and a nitrogen bonded to either hydrogens or alkyl groups. So really, really study these so that you can uh, um, pick them out and identify them when they're standing alone, but also if they're in a compound with multiple functional groups. Our aldehydes and ketones, which are carbonyl compounds. The aldehyde, let's look at it and its structure in detail. We have that carbonyl, carbon doubly bonded to the oxygen. That in turn in an aldehyde is bonded to a hydrogen on one side and there is that designation that R group. In R group again, just a carbon chain, an alkyl group of some length. It's shorthand, so we're going to remind you here, for an alkyl group, a carbon chain with hydrogens, or it could even be an aromatic ring. But we're uh, in this class, we're not looking a whole lot at aromatic compounds. And the ketone, let's see how it differs, the subtle differences. There it is, the carbonyl. They both have that carbonyl at the center. Okay, so one thing's the same, one alkyl group, all right there is it in our ketone and the difference is that that hydrogen that we had in the aldehyde is being replaced with an alkyl group so you have two of them and they don't have to be identical they can be different all right let's move on as we have before um, after looking at the functional group itself let's move on to how do we name aldehydes and ketones the very simplest of aldehydes also have common names. 
So you should be familiar with some of these because you just run into them so often. Um, some of the common aldehydes, common names for aldehydes, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and benzaldehyde. Here's the simplest aldehyde. So its common name is formaldehyde. The next simplest with two, uh, with one uh, carbon, all right, so this formaldehyde has got the carbonyl with two hydrogens, all right, that is formaldehyde. And when we remove one of those hydrogens and put on an alkyl group, we have uh, the next aldehyde, which is acid aldehyde. Okay, again, these are common names. And then benzaldehyde has got that benzene ring, six carbons, six hydrogens, alternating double and single bonds. Again, these are common names that you should be familiar with. Ketones. Again, some of the best known ones are really known by their common names. Uh, more often than they are known by their IUPAC names. So common names for ketones, how are they composed? These make a little bit more sense. Um, you give the names of the two alkyl groups that are bonded to the carbonyl and you follow it up with the word ketone. So it's very similar to how we named ethers. Okay. Remember with the ether, we had the oxygen sandwiched between. We named those two. We followed it with the word ether. All right. So we do the same thing here for the common names. So, and for this particular one, we even have a more common name. All right. So this would be dimethyl ketone. Okay. Um, but more often than not, we'll see this referred to as acetone. You might remember it from when you were in the lab. It's used as a solvent. Um, so here we have a four carbon ketone. Again, the common name for this, we would name the groups on either side. So here we have a methyl group and here we have an ethyl group. And we're going to follow it up with the word ketone. We'll alphabetize. So it's ethyl methyl ketone. All right. So you're familiar with some of the common names, um, the IUPAC names definitely need to know how to name aldehydes and ketones using the systematic nomenclature, as it's called. So how do we do it? When you're naming aldehydes and ketones, according to your IUPAC rules, the carbonyl has got to be included in your parent chain. So when you are trying to find the longest continuous carbon chain, it's got to contain that carbonyl. And secondly, when you number for keeps, you're going to number from the end that is closest to that carbonyl group. So it is taking precedence. It's the, um, the strong friend, as we, we called the hydroxyl group before. Since the carbonyl carbon of an aldehyde, right, it has to have a hydrogen on it. Right? So it's got to be at the end position of your compound. And it's always given position number one. And therefore, you don't include that number in the name. For ketones, though, ketones are not number one. All right. They have to have two alkyl groups. So they're going to be between carbons. So for ketones, the position of the carbonyl has got to be given unless there's an exception if it's a small enough compound and you don't have to explain where it is um, such as with a three carbon ketone there's only one place where it can be okay all right so lastly so we know how to get that parent chain the longest continuous carbon chain that contains the carbonyl you're going to number from the end closest to the carbonyl and then what are we going to do with that parent alkane name that told us how many carbons? We're going to drop that E from the name 
and we're going to add al for aldehydes notice al al okay aldehydes and o n e o n e for ketones okay Let's look at a few. Let's name them, and we're going to name them using the IUPAC naming system, but we're also going to throw in those common names, which I said you should be familiar with, and they're going to be in parentheses for every single one of these where they are possible. Remember, they're not possible in um, more uh, complicated aldehydes and ketones. All right, so here we have it. Here's our simplest aldehyde. Okay. So, IUPAC wise, one carbon is methane. Methane, we drop the E, it's an aldehyde, we add AL. So it's methanal. Common name, formaldehyde. All right, on to a two carbon aldehyde. Two carbons. Ethane, remove the E, add AL because it's an aldehyde, and we have F and Al. There we go. Okay, and this also had a common name. This was acid aldehyde. Okay, let's go to a th three carbons, but we're changing functional groups here. Notice it is a carbonyl, but it's sandwiched between two alkyl groups. So it's a ketone. All right, so how do we name this? We are going to number one, two, three, but really there's only one place where this carbonyl can be, so no number needed. Propane would be the alkane. Remove that E and add O-N-E. So it's propanone. Okay, propanone. And this one, this one's really, really common. Um, more off, more times than not, we see it as acetone, okay? Acetone, even more often than we see it uh, called dimethyl ketone, okay? Alrighty, let's look at this one again. We see that that carbonyl does not have a hydrogen, it's not on an end position, okay? Uh, so this is a ketone. Um, Numbering, we could number one, two, three, four, five, or we could come this way, one, two, three, four, five. So it's either two or four. The lowest number, the, we number the way closest to it. It's going to be in the two position. Okay, we have to specify it. All right, so we had five carbons. That would be pentane. We're going to remove the E, and we're going to put O-N-E, so it is to pent and own right and this one yes we could name it using the common names it would be methyl propyl ketone because we could name both of those all right let's do a couple more let's do this one here take a good look at it and we see all right we're talking aldehyde here okay Longest continuous carbon chain, one, two, three. So, prop and al, right? We don't have to say where it is because it's always number one. But on the two carbon right here, we have a methyl group. So we have to put that in the name. So it's going to be two dash methyl prop and al. Okay, so remember we run everything together if there's no number saying where that aldehyde is. 2-methylpropanal. One last one as practice. Here we go. Okay, take a good look at it. It is a ketone. All right, so it's going to end in O-N-E. Longest continuous carbon chain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right, so it's going to be a heptanone, right? But we see we have a substituent 
right? We also have to number the position of that carbonyl. And uh, we're going to give it the lowest possible number, so closest to, so it's one, two, and so it is on number three, okay? So we have to put it together so the methyl is on two, so it's going to be two dash methyl dash three dash, and we said three, four, five, six, seven, heptanone, okay? All right, very good. Make sure that you practice because practice makes perfect. Okay, so we know how to name our aldehydes and ketones. We know a little bit about the, um, the structure. All right, it is a, a polar bond. Okay, that carbonyl. So let's continue from there. All right. Before we continue, let's do a practice. Let's get the systematic IUPAC names for uh, these couple compounds here. Okay, here is one. And here is two. Okay, so you're going to be taking a few minutes here. And first place them in a category. What do we have? This first one here, aldehyde or ketone? Ketone, correct. Okay. Longest continuous carbon chain. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Let's see where we're going to number. One, two, three, so we're going to come this way, All right? One, two, and three, four, five, six. So it's a hex anone, right? And it's a three hex anone. Okay. How about this one here? Aldehyde or ketone? You said aldehyde. You're Correct, there it is. All right. We're gonna count one, two, three. Remember the aldehyde is always number one, and so it is one, right? Or just prop and own because there really is no other place for it to go. Or I'm sorry, prop and al, right? Because it's an aldehyde. Okay, very good. How about this one? This one, we're going to draw the structure for 4-methyl-hex-an-al. Right, so remember how I told you to do these? The thing that you're going to go to first is that parent. Okay? Parent. Hexan. Six. Six carbons in a row. All right? And... It's an aldehyde, so on one end you're going to put a carbonyl, one of those carbons, the last one, all right, of the six, is going to have a carbonyl and a hydrogen attached. And then you're going to count, all right, to number four, and what are we going to put? We're going to put a methyl group. And you're going to then fill in all of your hydrogens if you're doing an expanded structure, and then if you're asked to do a condensed, you're pulling it all down okay so here would be um, an expanded structure but it is missing all of the carbons notice all right it is understood that there is a carbon at every single juncture of two lines so carbon so that's number one right number two number three number four number four Five and number six. Okay, as we said, the first one, carbonyl with a hydrogen because it is an aldehyde, and then on four, so one, two, three, four, we have our methyl group. Okay, let's condense it just for practice. Oops, hiding behind my picture, so you could check it out on just the PowerPoint, which is. Um, 
it is under your files. Okay, so it'll be part two of chapter 12, PowerPoint, no picture, no video. Okay, so you can get the structure for this. All right, so good. Again, lots more practice in the textbook. Okay. Well, let's move to the properties. All right, let's look at the properties of aldehydes and ketones. Some things to recall. We started off our discussion looking at that carbonyl group that's central to the aldehyde and ketone. The carbonyl group, uh, the carbon is a po uh, positively charged, partial positive charge, and the oxygen because it's more electronegative has a partial negative charge so it's polar both the aldehydes and the ketones have this polar carbonyl group and so the fact that their carbonyl group is polar makes aldehydes and ketones moderately polar compounds okay no hydrogen bonding right? No oxygen to hydrogen bond. So what kind of interactions are we going to see between these molecules? We're going to see dipole-dipole interactions because we have polar bonds, right? So let's just pull out the carbonyl on one molecule of, a, of an aldehyde or a ketone there, okay? And then here is another one. All right, and you're going to find that they're going to uh, order themselves such that you have a dipole dipole attraction, that blue line there between the carbon on one right molecule and the oxygen on the other right dipole dipole interactions. So, in terms of strength, um, the dipole dipole interactions are not as strong as hydrogen bonds, right? But they are stronger than our um, London dispersion forces. Okay, so without the hydrogen on the oxygen, aldehydes and ketones, as we said, do not hydrogen bond to one another. But we do see these dipole-dipole interactions, okay? Um, although they can't hydrogen bond to each other, they can, though, because of the polarity of that carbonyl, they can form hydrogen bonds with water using the lone pair on the oxygen right? And the hydrogens of water. So with that in mind, let's compare the boiling points. Aldehydes and ketones, okay? No hydrogen bonding amongst their molecules, but dipole-dipole attractions. So where are they going to fall? They're going to have higher boiling points than alkanes and ethers that are similar uh, in mass but they're going to have lower boiling points than the alcohols, right? Because the dipole-dipole interaction, not as strong, doesn't take as much energy to break as the hydrogen bonds of the alcohols. The alcohols still have, are going to have the highest boiling points. So if we look at and compare boiling points um, for a variety of different compounds and this guy is a 58 here all right that didn't come out but we start with a four carbon alkane right hydrocarbon uh london dispersion forces that's it all right um and zero degrees celsius for its boiling point let's move to ether and ether right mass 60 so similar mass similar size okay and remember this is a polar bond Right, so you're going to see some dipole dipole between um, the molecules, and so consequently, a little bit higher there. Okay, all right. Um, but th these dipole dipoles here are not going to be as strong, okay, as, as the carbonyl. The carbonyl, much more polar bond, and so check out what happens to that boiling point, okay, much higher. Uh, much higher okay for the aldehyde keto but the highest yet because it has the hydrogen bonding are the alcohols so increase the boiling points increase as we go from uh, London dispersion forces right through a little bit of polar bonds to 
quite a lot of dipole-dipole interactions, and then the hydrogen bonds. How about their solubility in water? Well, that electronegative oxygen atom of the carbonyl group in both aldehydes and ketones is what can form hydrogen bonds with water. So let's look at this and show you what would be going on. So this is acid aldehyde. Okay. Um, there is our carbonyl, right? Carbon doubly bonded to the oxygen. Remember, it's got a, a partial negative charge. And our hydrogens of our water have got the partial positive, right? So hydrogen bond between uh, water molecules, okay, partial positive there, okay. So I, it's going to help our aldehyde as long as that carbon chain is short, right? It's going to help it dissolve in water. And here's our ketone. Right, same sort of thing, okay, um, where that partially negative polarized oxygen hydrogen bonds with the partial positive of our water molecules, okay. And again, as long as these alkyl parts, the hydrocarbon parts, are small, right then we're going to find that the ketones are going to be soluble in water to a certain extent. But after a while, um, the size of the, the hydrocarbon, right, the organic part, right, is going to win out and they're not going to be soluble. So aldehydes and ketones with fewer than five carbons are water soluble. But after that, uh, too much of the nonpolar part. To dissolve. Okay, well, I put this up here because um, there are so many common aldehydes and ketones. So you should be familiar with them, all right? Formaldehyde, all right? That's our simplest aldehyde, methanal, all right? It is toxic, but it's useful because it kills viruses, fungi, and bacteria. It's used to disinfect and sterilize equipment. Um, turns out formaldehyde will polymerize. It will uh, combine together and make long chains with other compounds by linking uh, CH2 groups. And the polymers are used to make plastics and adhesives for binding plywood. Um, fresh polymers uh, may outgas formaldehyde vapor. You may have gotten maybe plywood from the store um, and smelled a formaldehyde sort of smell. Acetaldehyde is much more sweet smelling, but narcotic. Um, it's present in ripe fruits, especially in apples. As your, your apple ripens, that's what you're smelling. You're smelling acetaldehyde. It's a metabolite of ethanol, and it is considerably less toxic than formaldehyde. Um, but formaldehyde, coming back to that, if you took biology lab, the animals that you dissect are preserved in formaldehyde typically, or at least they used to be when I was in biology. I don't know if they still are. Um, so we move on to another one, very common acetone that we use in the lab as a solvent. It's a super duper solvent. It's one of the most widely used solvents. Um, it dissolves most organic compounds, and hence we use it to uh, clean our glassware. It's also miscible in water, so in, in all proportions it dissolves, and so it's easy to rinse away. And um, casual exposure to acetone doesn't pose any health risk. As a matter of fact, it is uh, found in nail polish remover. It's highly volatile, so if you open that nail polish remover, you're going to smell it real quick. Um, it's also highly flammable. A few of the biological aldehydes and ketones. On this slide, we see three of probably the most important or, uh, or more, most well-known, we'll say, biological aldehydes and ketones. We begin on the far left over here, 
and it's glucose. Take a look at that molecule. This is what I, I meant about knowing your um, your functional groups, okay, and be, being able to pick them out. Glucose is an aldehyde. We see right there an aldehyde, but it also has alcohol groups. So it's a polyhydroxy aldehyde, okay? We move on here to another sugar. This is fructose, D-fructose. And look at the functional groups. Again, we see the hydroxyl groups. So they're alcohol, right? This is a polyhydroxy. Uh, but over here, we see a, a ketone. Okay, so fructose is a ketone. Carbonyl bonded to a carbon and another carbon. Okay, so... And our last one is the hormone cortisone. Cortisone is a ketone, All right? There's several of them on here, as a matter of fact, okay? Here's a ketone right there, okay? Here's a ketone right there, bonded on either side to a carbon. And here's, yet, whoa, another one, okay? So... Cortisone is, the hormone cortisone is a ketone. Well, we're going to backtrack into reactions of alcohols, but while we're discussing reactions of alcohols, we're going to tie in what we just studied, the aldehydes and the ketones. All right. So, reactions. The first reaction of aldehydes and ketones that you have to be familiar with is the dehydration of an alcohol. Alcohols undergo dehydration. That term means they're going to lose water. When do they undergo dehydration? When you treat them with a strong acid catalyst. When they dehydrate, we get alkenes. So what does that mean? That means the alcohol, right? We're losing the OH, the hydroxyl group. The hydroxyl group is lost in a dehydration from one carbon. And then a hydrogen is lost from an adjacent carbon. And then what do we get? We get an alkene product. So let's look at this. Okay, let's follow it. So here's our alcohol. Okay, there's our OH, right? We said we're going to lose uh, our hydroxyl from a carbon, and then from an adjacent carbon, we're going to lose a hydrogen. So we're showing both of them. And you could see how we're going to get water. All right, so in the presence, what did we say, of an, a strong acid catalyst, right, which I'm not showing, we lose, right, our OH, our hydrogen, and we form a double bond, right? If we lose those, we have to reposition a bond to give you four bonds to carbon and get water. In a dehydration, you lose water, dehydrate, okay, loss of water. You might notice something about this reaction. If we were to reverse this reaction, if we were to add water in the presence of acid, we get the alcohol, what is this? This is hydration of an alkene, right? This dehydration of an alcohol is the exact reverse of the hydration of an alkene that you learned in chapter 11. How cool is that? Go from here with reactions of alcohols. We move to oxidation of alcohols. All right. When we talk about oxidation of alcohols, there's something critically important to remember. In organic chemistry, oxidation is defined as meaning the adding of oxygen to a molecule, to a compound, or the removing of hydrogen. Right? Either of those two things constitutes an oxidation and reduction means the adding of hydrogen or the removing of oxygen 
So they're the exact opposite. Oxygen means, or I'm sorry, oxidation means the adding of oxygen. That's pretty easy to remember. Or the removing of hydrogen. All right. Then reduction is the exact opposite. In the oxidation of an alcohol, two hydrogen atoms are removed from the alcohol. One hydrogen that's being removed is coming from the hydroxyl group, the OH group. And the second one comes from the carbon that's bonded to the hydroxyl group. So we're going to lose two hydrogens. Remember what we said, it's the addition of oxygen or the removal of hydrogen, all right? So when we oxidize an alcohol, we're losing two hydrogens. Let's look at this. This is a general reaction. We're just going to take a random alcohol. So here's our carbon, right? Four bonds to it. We're not going to specify what we have here, all right? In an oxidation, we're going to remove two hydrogens, one from the hydroxyl group and one from the carbon attached to it. So I've enumerated those. All right, so let's bring in an oxidizing agent, okay? That O in parentheses is what we as organic chemists often use to, to, uh, to mean we're using an oxidizing agent. Who are oxidizing agents? There's a number of them, all right? Uh, they're inorganic compounds. You should be able to name them KMnO4, potassium permanganate, or K2CR207, which is potassium dichromate. Both of those are really common oxidizing agents. Okay, but a lot of times you're just going to see that oxygen in parentheses. All right, if not, it's going to be one of these two compounds. All right, so what happens when we lose? those things right so we're going to lose a bond here we have to form it right and our oxygen loses one so it needs to pick one up we form a carbonyl all right carbonyl compound when we oxidize an alcohol we're going to get a carbonyl compound okay now we're not specifying what's on either side right who can they be they could be both uh, carbon groups right both are groups alkyl groups or one can be an alcohol, one could be a hydrogen, okay? So different kinds of carbonyl compounds can be formed. And it's all going to depend upon the alcohol that we start with. And in addition, these oxidation conditions. Let's look at this oxidation of an alcohol in more detail. Remember, early on when you were introduced to alcohols, you learned that alcohols were classified according to the number of groups attached to the hydroxyl carbon. All right, so remember what a primary alcohol looks like. Primary alcohols are converted to either an aldehyde if you carefully control your oxidation conditions, or if you're not so careful and you keep oxidizing, you're going to get a carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's draw this reaction out. Okay, primary alcohol, remember what they looked like. Okay, carbonyl, or I'm sorry, the carbon. Uh, the hydroxyl carbon, the one that's bonded to the hydroxyl group, there it is. And how many alkyl groups? Just one, right? which means you have two hydrogens. Right? Let's oxidize and let's be really careful. Let's not add excess. Let's add perfect amount, right? One to one. Um, and when that happens, we end up losing this, right? And the bond comes in, right? And then we lose one of these, okay? And we end up with an aldehyde. So we can 
take primary alcohol and oxidize it very carefully to an aldehyde. Now, if you want to, you can add more excess, all right? More, second step, all right? And it will continue to oxidize, all right? And if it continues to oxidize, what happens, right? We take the aldehyde and it is converted to a carboxylic acid, right? So what happens here? We remember what the definition of an oxidation was, right? The addition of oxygen or removal of hydrogen, right? What did we do in this case in going from the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid? We didn't lose a hydrogen. We added an oxygen. Okay, all right. So oxidation of an alcohol, primary alcohols oxidize carefully, right? If we do it carefully, we can get an aldehyde. All right. Secondary alcohols. Secondary alcohols are converted to ketones on treatment with an oxidizing agent. So let's look at a secondary alcohol. There we go. Okay, there is our hydroxyl carbon, right? The carbon attached to the hydroxyl group. And we're showing that hydrogen, right? We're showing the hydrogen attached, right? We're going to lose this, and we're going to lose this. And we're going to form a double bond. When we form a double bond, um, we end up with a ketone. So oxidation of a secondary alcohol gives us a ketone. Okay. Tertiary alcohols. Tertiary alcohols don't react with oxidizing agents. Remember what we said happens with an alcohol. We lose a hydrogen from the hydroxyl group and from the hydroxyl carbon. There is no hydrogen on the carbon atom attached to the hydroxyl group. So tertiary alcohols oxidize. All right, let's move on to oxidation of aldehydes and ketones. Well, we've already seen when we talked about the aldehydes that aldehydes can be further oxidized to carboxylic acids. Treat an aldehyde with more oxidizing agent and we go to the carboxylic acid, we add an oxygen. Ketones though, can't be oxidized. Okay, what do we need? We have nothing right to insert there okay so oxidizing agent no reaction with a ketone okay nothing to get all right in regards to these uh, oxidation reactions we have an important test that's used in um, the health sciences and one of them is known as the uh, the Tollins test so you should be familiar with this test. The Tollens reagent contains silver plus one, so the silver ion. And the silver ion oxidizes aldehydes. So it's an oxidizing agent, and it oxidizes aldehydes, not ketones. So if the silver oxidizes the aldehyde, right? What happens to it is it gets reduced to metallic silver, plain old silver, not the ion. And metallic silver looks like a mirror in the test tube, okay? So this is what happens when you take a sil take silver ion and it gets reduced, right, to silver solid. It looks like a mirror. Okay, mirror has formed in this in the test tube. So 
Tallinn's reagent, which contains the silver ion, selectively oxidizes an aldehyde and it forms this mirror. So it becomes a test for aldehydes, right? Uh, you can tell whether you have an aldehyde or a ketone. If you have an aldehyde, you're going to get the silver mirror. If you have a ketone, you're not going to get the silver mirror, right? So this is the uh, the actual reagent, the Tollens reagent. There it is, all right? Um, and so it's got a silver plus one in it, and it will oxidize an aldehyde, right? And when it oxidizes the aldehyde, it turns into silver metal, which gives you the silver mirror. This reaction does not occur with ketones. So it's a way to differentiate between an aldehyde and a ketone. We have another test known as Benedict's test. Benedict's reagent contains a copper plus two ion and it reacts with aldehydes that have a hydroxyl group adjacent to the aldehyde. When an aldehyde is oxidized, right, remember we get a carboxylic acid and that copper plus two that did the oxidation gets reduced to copper oxide. The change from one to the other changes color. So the color changes when it's when it's copper plus two, you end up with a beautiful blue solution, or you start with a beautiful blue solution. And when it gets reduced, then you end up with um, a brick red color. So that change in color would indicate that you have an aldehyde that is adjacent to a hydroxyl group. So this is what the color change looks like. All right, this is the reagent to begin with. All right, so if you add then in an unknown and you're trying to find out, do I have an aldehyde uh, with a hydroxyl group next to it? I drop it in and if it turns this uh, brick red color, you know it's a positive test. So Benedict's test is super duper important because it is a test for glucose. Remember glucose, all right, is an aldehyde right and it has hydroxyl groups on the carbons adjacent to it so this benedict's test is a test for glucose uh, in the blood or the urine um, let's show you the uh the glucose all right remember we saw it earlier so this is just another uh, depiction of it here is the aldehyde group right c double bond oh that is condensed down okay each one of these is a carbon right so carbon, 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 and adjacent to that um, aldehyde, what do we have? We have hydroxyl group. So when we add Benedict's uh, solution, which is blue, it's got the copper plus two, it oxidizes this, right, to the carboxylic acid, and it changes uh, to that brick red color and we get a positive test for glucose in the urine. If we don't have any glucose in the urine or in the blood, then we're not going to see the color change. All right, let's see. I think this is the last reaction that we have. Reduction of aldehydes and ketones. Reduction is just the reverse of oxidation. Remember what we said it was, all right? It's going to be the loss of oxygen, okay? Um, so in reduction of a carbonyl group, right, what we're going to see is the addition of two hydrogens across the double bond, all right? Because remember, it could be uh, that we're going to lose oxygens or we're going to add hydrogens, okay? So reduction of a carbonyl, 
and we're going to see the addition of two hydrogens across that carbonyl double bond. One hydrogen is going to go to the carbon of the carbonyl and one is going to go to the oxygen. And what you're going to get is an alcohol. Remember how we got aldehydes and ketones in the first place? Oxidation of an alcohol. So reduction of an aldehyde or ketone is going to send us right back to the alcohol. What reagents are typically used? Well, reducing reagents, uh, they could be hydrogen um, along with a metal catalyst such as platinum. Uh, they could be lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride or um, in biochemical systems that hydride ion uh, is supplied by NADH. And remember, we said this is the reverse of the oxidation of the alcohol. So aldehydes are going to be reduced to primary alcohols. Okay. So we're going to add a hydrogen up here, and we're going to add a hydrogen to this carbon. And when we do that with any of those reducing agents, right, there we get it. We get the primary alcohol. Okay. Remember how we got the aldehyde. We took that primary alcohol and we oxidized it. Ketones, how did we make them? Well, they came from secondary alcohols. So if we reduce a ketone, we're going to get the secondary alcohol back. There's our ketone. Reduction, right? What is it? It's either the loss of oxygen or the addition of hydrogen. We're going to add hydrogen here. And we're going to add a hydrogen to that carbon. Let's do it with any of our reducing agents. And when we do that, we end up with the secondary alcohol there. We added a hydrogen here to the oxygen. We added one to that hydroxyl carbon. And that's it, folks. That is the end of the material in chapter 12. And that's um, as far as our quiz next week is going to go. A um, little bit of information on that quiz. Your quiz is actually going to be during class time. So we're going to do it um, again. Let's see for Monday class. It's going to be 11 a.m. on Monday and it'll be 20 minutes, 20 questions. OK. That'll be on Canvas. And for Tuesday class, it will be at class time. So 1.30. Um, and again, it's going to be 20 minutes, 20 questions during class time on Tuesday. And additionally, you'll have a new PowerPoint next week. All right. Happy studying.